You know, uh, one of my favorite lines from Martin Luther King, he said, our lives begin to end on the day we stop talking about things that matter. And our society has been, before the pandemic, previous to the pandemic, we were so preoccupied, most of us, most of the time, because of the assault, the ubiquitous assault of the ultimately meaningless uh, that dominates our popular culture. We spent so much time talking about, reading about, and thinking about things that don't ultimately matter. I think that that's begun to change, and I think that there is a hunger, and also we have time and bandwidth that in many cases we didn't have before. The truth is we have some great thinkers, great writers, great people who are out there in American culture and world culture, and so it's exciting to have a chance to uh, invite some of the people I read, I'm excited by, whether it's Stephanie Kelton or... um, uh, or, or Matt Taibbi, whether you know whether it's a political voice or whether it's a a spiritual voice. I'm doing both. Uh, Carolyn Mays, um, uh, wonderful people. Just if, if 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 I'm interested in them, I think that it's more of a more of a chance that the audience will be interested in. It's really exciting. I'm enjoying doing it, as I assume you enjoy doing this yourself. It's also very important at this moment uh, yeah. with the assault on corporate media, which we know too well, to have more voices. Uh, we were talking <laughs> about this sure. at the beginning of the show. Yeah. <laughs> if we want to push back against the propaganda, uh, the corporate yeah. propaganda and, and the military industrial complex propaganda, we need to really populate as many spaces as possible. And I, I think what you're talking about there is extremely significant because the mainstream corporate media, as you know, um, and as you said, uh, that does dominate and pre-prescribe what we are to consider the political issues that matter routinely peripheralizes not only progressive voices, but more important cultural voices, philosophical Mm -hmm. voices, spiritual voices, religious voices, artistic voices, humanitarian voices that absolutely should be part of of the dialogue. This whole idea that politics is just a lane over here and it's a group of people that are the ones who are, are, are somehow entitled to not only say what they think, but to to literally prescribe what the conversation will even be, much less who should be in that conversation, has taken us to where we are. And the idea that we're looking to the people whose mindset took us to where we are to lead us out of the ditch that they drove us into is seen, I think, by a lot of lot increasing number of people to be absurd. You ran a transformational presidential campaign. You undoubtedly uh, shifted the conversation, scared a lot of people. But I I have this memory. uh, I can't remember which debate it was, possibly the first debate. After the debate, you sat down with Anderson Cooper. And Anderson Cooper's mother had just recently passed away. Mm -hmm. And I was so moved by the conversation you had with him um, in which he seemed to recognize your value and your presence and what you meant, not just for the Democratic primary, but for society and, and, and the, the effect you've had on so many people uh, in his orbit, himself. And I thought it was a really moving conversation. And then to suddenly see mm-hmm. the corporate media swoop in and just, it, it, was like, it was like he hadn't caught up with the talking points yet that he was yeah. forced to share. Um, they were clearly scared of you. I mean, the way that yeah. they treated you compared to other candidates who polled less, never, you know, never broke through the pack, never won a state. Um, it was very clear what their agenda was. I mean, how did that feel for you? Well, it's, it's interesting that you name uh, Anderson Cooper because you're right. I had talked to him twice on the air. There had been meaningful conversations. I had known his mother, although he had not known that. Um, and then clearly someone said, you're being way too nice to her. I mean, it was so it was so clearly clear that someone said, get that woman off the stage. And you're right. And the the talking points, which we all know how that works, uh, they were they were specific. They were everywhere. I'm dangerous. No, Mickey, I'm crazy. You'd think it was the Middle Ages or something. She's dangerous. She's crazy. She's, she's anti-vax. <laughs> she's anti-science. She's anti-medicine. Uh, she's a grifter. Um, and uh, you're right. And, and with him, when he really with an ambush, because he was bringing up the, t- the topic of uh, involving Big Pharma, I should have come right back at him. Uh, it's so funny because uh, to look back at that and think uh, I should have just been tougher and given it right back. But uh, I was shocked and obviously not, not ready for that moment. Well, they also hadn't really, uh, in recent history, treated a candidate the way that they treated you. I think they tried with Bernie. I'm, I'm not saying that they that he he did not receive he has not received pushback, but I think they saw they saw this movement growing and coming. And not only was there Bernie on stage, there was you and and Andrew Yang, and some, to some extent, although now he's a CNN contributor, so I think he was given a different uh, uh, set of questions. 
But I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. I mean, aside from the media experience, what was the biggest lesson, uh, political lesson you learned out of your, your time running for president? Well, it's like they're two parallel universes. I found talking to voters exhilarating. The American people are not stupid. Uh, I think we're dignified, decent people. And I had had over 30 years of experience talking uh, to people, you know, just audiences. So my faith in that sense in democracy was fortified. My concern, deep concern about how the political media industrial complex suppresses and obstructs democracy was also fortified because I've seen how the whole thing works. Um, mm -hmm. It's one experience when you're talking to people and it's another thing to see this reality TV show of how campaigns operate, um, the operatives, the, the way the media is so cozy, most of the mainstream media is so cozy with people they shouldn't be so cozy with. You, you, there shouldn't be reporters yeah. getting their getting their talking points from the Tom Perez's of the world, but on some level, that's clearly how it works. Yeah. Oh, I I, I know that firsthand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um. You know, we're going into this new presidency. Joe Biden, of course, won. You you as I did said it was the smarter decision to vote for Joe Biden. Um. But the pressure does not stop there. Clearly, uh, he won. We don't throw our hands up in the air. But he is making it, and and the Democratic establishment are making it very difficult for progressives to feel like they can pressure um, the establishment. Establishment just seems right now to be extremely, uh, they're just, just ignoring, not the left, but working people. I mean, it's very concerning to see the appointments in the transition committee, um, who, who they're prioritizing, big business, pharma, big ag, uh, Monsanto, uh, you know, there's, there's obviously a list of, of major corporations, Uber, Lyft, et cetera. And yet labor is missing from the conversation. And of course, anybody um, who has been part of the rising left, you know, you, I, what I loved about your campaign is that you just saw political power from a completely different perspective. And I think it blew people's minds in many good ways to see what, what could be brought to the table, like reparations, like a department of peace. And then you see the Biden administration have this rotating cast of characters that have been in the uh, in the administrations in the past, or have been have worked for Raytheon, have worked for um, the military industrial complex, complex, the the consulting firms, and just to see how different his message is to what I think Americans and the world needs right now, given this crisis. So, how do you see us? able to mobilize and, and push for change when you have an administration, from my opinion, that is just completely, has blinders up. Uh, a woman has taught her whole life that if anybody comes at you to mug you or to attack you, just start screaming and don't shut up. I did, as you said, and as you did, uh, say, I, I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. I think it's important that we vote for Joe Biden because the most important uh, priority had to be at that moment, removing the neo-fascists from the White House. I thought he would be a moment of pause, uh, giving us an opportunity to regroup. And that's exactly what we need to do now. Um, I want to give credit where credit's due. I didn't think Janet Yellen was a terrible um, uh, choice. I'm okay with Blinken as long as uh, uh, Rashida uh, Tlaib is also there to make sure he remembers some things and he needs to remember. I'm not, a, I'm not uh, upset with Mayorkas, but then some of these others that are coming in, and you mentioned Raytheon. I think we need to yell and keep yelling when it comes to the appointment of, of Austin, Lloyd Austin, as at the Pentagon. First of all, what does it mean for Congress to pass bills and then just use a waiver to ignore any that they don't like. So that's first of all. Second of all, he was on the board. He has been on the board of Raytheon. We're already talking about a $760 billion defense budget compared to a $40 billion State Department budget. Anything that has to do with humanitarian assistance, anything that has to do with uh, USAID, anything that has to do with peace building is given just these little crumbs. Diplomacy in general is given crumbs compared to the militarization of our foreign policy. I read an article a couple of years ago uh, where one of those uh, the people within the military uh, within the foreign uh, policy establishment said, 
airstrikes are in, diplomacy is out. Oh my so God. <laughs> it was interesting because I heard Austin, I know it's, it's so hideous. So I heard Austin on television yesterday, clearly trying to do damage control, clearly showing up now in his business suit rather than his general's uniform saying, I totally respect the wisdom, the wisdom of the founders in wanting um, civilian leadership. My doubt, I, I don't doubt his sincerity as a human being, but he wouldn't know about the wisdom of civilian leadership because that's not where he's been. He knows about the wisdom of military leadership. He knows about the, his filter is Raytheon. His filter is the military. All of those have a place. They should not be the boss. So when you ask, what do we do? We need to talk about it and not shut up about it. And that's what certainly I'm trying to do. Uh, my social media, any platform that I have, this man should not head the Pentagon. And there are too many people. If we have, the last one was a general. They, they passed a waiver for, for Mattis. Then they're going to pass a waiver for this one. We're going to get to the point where we have so normalized military, military leadership of our foreign policy establishment which is already horrifying when you, uh, if you ever read Ronan Farrow's book, War on Peace. I mean, it's become a joke. The State Department has been so peripheralized, or in the case of the Trump, uh, Trump administration turned over uh, more to economic issues than to security issues, such as the $360 billion arms sale to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And, you know, when they asked him about the obvious immorality of that in terms of uh, people starving in Yemen, he said, sometimes you can have strategic partnerships with people who do not share your values. So human values are just peripheralized while the militarization, the um, use of brute force, all of these things are seen more and more as central to American foreign policy. This is disastrous. And when you ask, what do we need to do about it? Start yelling and yeah. don't shut up. Yeah. And, you know, and it's all for what? To protect oil interest, geopolitical, you know, yeah. pseudo Cold War uh, games that are happening. It's 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 ridiculous. Um, so I, I want to talk about a couple of things. I, we, first, we have some, a lot of people in the chat are asking and, and this is their question. <laughs> Uh, they're they're campaigning, they're rallying around you, uh, potentially running against one of the biggest defenders of the military industrial complex in the Senate, Senator Dianne Feinstein. Have you thought about this at all? Is this on the table? She's got four more years, first of all, doesn't she? She has four more years. Um, you know, it's funny because at this point in my life, I'm living in D.C. now. I was in New York for two years before the camp, the um uh, b before the campaign, it's sort of like, where do I come from? It's almost like there's no state, including California, where I wouldn't be seen as a bit of a carpet bagger. Um, and also, I think it's pretty interesting, and the key, I think that the state parties, when you look, and California would be an example, so would New York. There are people who have been lining up for years uh, to, running, to run for something like Diane C. The pushback, the blowback, the hostility, the viciousness would be every bit as, as hard. Uh, for a Senate race as for a president. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we've seen this happen. I mean, I even saw it at my local level uh, yeah. when I ran the, yeah. the viciousness, the no scares, the attacks, mm -hmm. no easy. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, I think folks also need to be prepared for that while we urge everybody to run also be prepared for what could come if you're seen as a threat, if you're representing the left and especially if you're representing the left against somebody who wants to appear to be left. <laughs> and especially in a state like California where yes. so many people have been standing in line for so long. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I want to quickly talk about reparations because our next segment, we are going to have Representative Chris Rabb, who is a, a legislator in Pennsylvania who has a reparations bill uh, that he's prevent, presented before the legislature. But you really uh, brought to light and I think pressured other lawmakers uh, to come out in support of reparations, as well as your colleagues on stage. And it was, I think that should be in the history books. I mean, the moment that you brought the, ex you explained what reparations would be, the history of reparations to a Americans who may not be familiar with it. Um, you became a great conduit for, for the idea of a reparations bill to be in the mainstream. And I want to play a quick clip. Dorsey, can we put the clip up from the debate, um, uh, the Democratic debate where Marianne brought this up? Thank you, Congressman Rourke. Speaking of reparations, Ms. Williams, Ms. Williamson, many of your opponents support a commission to study the issue of reparations for slavery. 
but you are calling for up to $500 billion in financial assistance. What makes you qualified to determine how much is owed in reparations? Well, first of all, it's not $500 billion in financial assistance. It's $500 billion, 200 to $500 billion payment of a debt that is owed. That is what reparations is. We need some deep truth telling when it comes. We don't need another commission to look at evidence. I appreciate what uh, Congressman O'Rourke has said. It is time for us to simply realize that this country will not heal. All that a country is is a collection of people. People heal when there's some deep truth telling. We need to recognize that when it comes to the economic gap between blacks and whites in America, it does come from a great injustice that has never been dealt with. That great injustice has had to do with the fact that there was 250 years of slavery followed by another 100, 100 years of domestic terrorism. What makes me qualified to say 200 to $500 billion? I'll tell you what makes me qualified. If you did the math of the 40 acres and a mule, given that there was four to five million slaves at the end of, of of the Civil War, they were fortified, and they were all promised 40 acres and a mule for every family of four. If you did the math today, it would be trillions of dollars. And I believe that anything less than $100 billion is, is an insult. And I believe that 200 to 500 billion is, is politically feasible today because so many Americans realize there is an injustice that continues to form a toxicity underneath the surface, an emotional turbulence Ms. that Williamson, only reparations Thank you very much. Senator Sanders. I have the chills watching that again, and you're right here. <laughs> I, the audience clearly responded. Uh, yeah, that's to, Detroit. To <laughs> it's, it was Detroit, right? They know exactly. what goes there. They know the truth about race in Detroit. Exactly. So, I mean, what, what really, conf- I'm so happy you mentioned we don't need another commission because I think that is. Yeah, exactly. That that is a game for for those of you watching right now. That is a game that uh, that 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 is played in union halls. It's played in organizations. It's played in Congress. It's played in Democratic Party. If you want to delay something, set up up a commission, and then you put and- it on the shelf. Then you put it on the shelf. Exactly. And, and then you put it on the <clears throat> shelf. You drag it out. People don't pay attention, and then you water it down. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why when people talk about- I think we're we're having a little bit of a delay here. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, and that, I agree with you entirely. And when John Conyers came up with HR 40 for his time, that was really radical to to go there, to have a commission to start talking about it. But now we need to start putting some money on the table. And I felt that that it's time, you know, Germany has paid $89 billion to Jewish organizations in reparation since World War II. It doesn't mean the Holocaust didn't happen, but it has gone far towards establishing psychological and emotional reconciliation between Germany and the Jews of Europe. That war was over in 1945. We're talking about a war that was over in 1864, 1865. And as I said in that clip, the toxicity, the burden, the injustice, the anger is like a baton that we just pass from one generation to the next. And for a nation, just like for an individual, you've got to clean up things from the past if you really want the future to be as free as it could be. This is not... um, when you look at something like Germany and, and the Jews, by the 20th century, the idea of paying reparations was not considered some fringe idea, and it should not be considered fringe idea today. Uh, it doesn't have to be this long, uh, painful, anguished conversation if someone simply presents it to people intelligently. I, in my experience on the campaign in some of the whitest states out there, Iowa, New Hampshire. My experience, Namiki, is not that people are racist, but so much as that, or the average anyway, I mean, obviously there are racists in America, but I don't think the average American is racist so much as the average person is deeply undereducated and underinformed about the history of race in the United States. And what I would find is when I would give people a little five minute sketch, the first slave ships came over in 1619. It, slavery lasted for almost 250 years. There were between 400 and 500, uh, 400 and 500, 5 million slaves at the end. Tecumseh Sherman uh, said to every former slave family of four, we will give you 40 acres and a mule, which would have given people an opportunity to move forward with their lives. In the vast majority of cases that, that was not given, even where it was given, it was taken back. After 12 years of, of 
Reconstruction, you had what amounted to 100 years after the end of the Civil War until the Civil Rights Act of segregation, which is domestic terrorism. You're talking about 350 million, uh, 350 years of violence, systemic institutionalized violence perpetrated by one group of people against another. Let's just talk about this. Let's just really put a, a number on the table. We had the Civil Rights Act in 1964 we had the Voting Rights Act uh, in 1965. And if Martin Luther King had lived, then I think the next thing we would have gotten to was the economic peace. It's simply something that has not been done yet. And I feel that it's our generation's turn. And you know, what's interesting is, is so you look at South America, for, for instance, <clears throat> where there were there were political genocides. There was a war against communists or anybody who might be affiliated or related to a communist or a mm-hmm. union member. In many parts of South America, pretty much collectively, even with the divisions that exist today, there were truth and reconciliation commissions, just as there was, of course, in South South Africa. And there were economic rewards given to many families, not rewards, but they were earned because their families were just swooped up and murdered in the middle of the night and and left out wherever for folks to see. Um, This is something that we... As a as a as a globe, as a democratic lowercase D democratic, uh, you know, most democratic countries have come to terms with, and yet we can't even do it on our on our own land. Well, and, and is, of course, there's an economic model that's tied to that, correct? Well, yes, but there's also racism tied to that. Remember, we paid around twenty thousand uh, dollars under Ronald Reagan. Uh, to Civil Liberties Act, to uh, every surviving person who had been a prisoner of the Japanese internment camps. So even in the United States, we have recognized and admitted before about terrible transgressions that were committed and for which economic remuneration made sense. What what keeps a lot of this, uh, the conversation stuck here, is how many people say, yes, but that happened before I was born, generations before I was born. And even there, Nomiki, I think that there's a lot of educating that people need. Because when people recognize how the economic gap uh, that existed at the end of slavery has never been closed, and why? You know, I'm old enough to get, you know, segregation wasn't over until 1960, until 64, 65. I'm old enough to know that wasn't all that long ago. And the fact that, uh, it happened generations before doesn't mean that the that the nation can go forward the way we want to go forward, white America or black America, unless we're willing to pay this debt and then get on with it. That's what reparations would enable us to do. And my plan was for $500 billion, which I believe could be more now. People have convinced me it could be up to a trillion dollars. That is, and some people should be much more than that. I don't think anything more than that is feasible. We've got to remember You've got a $760 billion Pentagon budget every year. And my idea was not that white America should decide how the money got spent, whether it had to do with aid to historically uh, black colleges or anything else, but that the money would be handed over, actually, uh, over a period of 20 years to a, a, a commission of black Americans who represented voices in academia and politics and leadership and civic government in all the various ways. And the choice of these people obviously would be extremely, extremely important. And that they themselves uh, would get to decide. White people shouldn't be telling black people how that money gets spent. And um, I think it will be actually, to use an oft used phrase now, very healing for the country. (laughs) <laughs> you're referencing how uh, yeah. Joe Biden has co-opted your phrase. <laughs> they take the messages. If only they took the policy position, I'd be very happy. Do you send them your book now? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Well, that was very clear. But, you know, what's inside the book is not just what's outside. But the, the quotes made it obvious. Some of his quotes made it obvious. Yeah. He just needed the talking points. Just insert that in the book with it. Um, uh, before we wrap up, I, I, I want to touch on a couple of things. But first, just... Is do you think that there's an entrance point um, to have this conversation with Joe Biden, who who credits Black Americans for his win, and of course Kamala Harris, who is a Black American, who, to have this conversation about reparations? Were they open to it at all during behind the scenes? Maybe well, uh, if you'll remember, if if you'll remember the the debate where I brought up, I said the Democratic Party should stand for reparations, and it was uh, the Vice President Elect who said. No, I'm the person uh, on this on this stage who should talk about that. And of course, he went right to another topic immediately. If I was then who I am now, I would have said, wait, 
what just happened here? So when we talk about Israel, Bernie and I are the only people we get to talk, you know, I would have been far more like what I was really. Um, it's an uncomfortable conversation, I think, uh, for a lot of people. But look, I, I'm not, I, I don't doubt Joe Biden's sincerity in wanting to deal with issues of systemic racism. Uh, I know a lot of people who watch a show are guffawing that I said that, but I'm not somebody who just wants to pre-damn everything they do. Um, no, nobody's <laughs> asking my opinion, but I'm still putting my opinion out there, and uh, as as are you and others. And I think a lot of things that many of us say are noticed, uh, whether we get a phone call or are asked to attend a meeting or not. And also, I've had enough experience in my life um, to know the limits to that. I, I've, I've, I've been there. I spent a weekend at Camp David. I understand. I've, I've, I've had all that. Uh, and, they, they, and it's all very lovely. And then corporate America still rules on such a level that the system works the way the system works. So I think sometimes you just put a message out there. It's in the ethers. People start talking about it. And it affects in ways that you may not ever even know directly. It affects the conversation and ultimately affects politics. And that's what's going to happen in this country with many of these issues, whether it has to do with Medicare for all, free college, cancellation of the college loan debt. We just keep going. You know, that's one of the things. Republicans, they say something you don't like, what do they do? They say it again. Yep. You don't like it, they say it again. Democrats, they say something, you say something they don't like, everybody gets all twisted and starts re-languaging re it. That's what progressives need to not do. Progressives need to do what many of us are doing, which is more like the Republicans do. You don't like what I said, let me say it again. Medicare for all, you didn't like that. Let me say it for again, Medicare for all. And I do think that's happening. There are a lot of us out there. And it's like in advertising, sometimes you have to say something three times before it even really gets into anybody's head. We just need to start yelling and not shut up. What are your plans for 2021? Anything big? Uh, well, I, I have my podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm talking to some people about the development of a television show, perhaps. I'd like to do a nightly uh, sort of... Um, Wrap up. You know, Namiki, I felt for a long time that if Oprah and Jon Stewart had not gone off the air when they did, that Trump would never have became, mm. become president. Because wow. when the Oprah show was on, it's like we had a town meeting every day of a, just a conversation around human decency. Mm. And every night with Jon Stewart on, there was a hip conscious take on the news. They sort of held something together both in politics and in just human dignity and decency. And there was no town square of dignity, decency, and hip conscious politics. And uh, that's what all of us are trying to do to the best of our ability. And uh, I want to do it too. I love that. I mean, it's, uh, you of course are, are friends with Oprah and we're regular on Oprah. I, 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 years. I have, I have my own opinions about her, her political perspective and maybe her even um, in terms of capitalism. But I do think what you're saying, I mean, we did, I watched it regularly. There was a spiritual uh, uh, depth and a focus, which you Absolutely. were a part of. And with that, I, I, I think, you know, some of the conversations around um, the spiritual movement right now and, and some of it splicing off into Trump land is, is concerning. And I think it's also very important to have your voice out there because it kind of reminds folks what, what really this is all about. And it's, Thank you. Uh, Thank as we you. said at the top of the show, right you know, millions you. of Americans are hungry right now. And that's what it comes down to. I think there is a hunger for meaning and depth. Um, if you eat just a bunch of junk food long enough, you kind of want some broccoli. Mm -hmm. If all you do is read trashy magazines and novels after a while, you're in the mood for Jane Austen or do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think that COVID has reminded us of our depths in a way. And, uh, and what I have found, but this has been throughout my career, but it was also true on the campaign. You know, my father was a lawyer and he used to say, talk to the smartest person on the jury. And mm -hmm. I found on the campaign the people were totally down for it. And even, like I said, talking about the widest audiences, talking about reparations. Once I gave the thumbnail sketch and made, people could see that it makes all the sense in the world, there'd be major standing ovations among all white audiences. The, the educational, I mean, excuse me, the political establishment we have today speaks to the lowest denominator yeah. because all that they're, they're trying to do is get power. 
why don't we give the American people the option of doing the right thing? Why don't we give the American people the option of making the noble decision? Why don't we give the, the American people the option of following the heart's intelligence as much as the mind's intelligence, since that is the only way the human race will have a chance of surviving for another hundred years? I think the people are ready for it. The political establishment just needs to get out of the way and let the people have the conversation that the people want to have. <laughs> Make my clicks heard for the podcast. <laughs> Thanks for watching and listening to The Nomi Key Show. But remember to click like and subscribe on YouTube and please share on social media. If you're not already a patron, please join us for as low as $5 a month on patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show for early and special content. That investment makes a huge difference. We are not corporate media raking in the dough. It's really you guys that are keeping us going. So please consider being a patron. And to our current patrons, thank you so much. We are incredibly grateful to you. We also now have swag. So check us out on the to get your mugs, your totes, and your stickers.